So I'd like to welcome Ricky Schlott and Greg Lukianoff, 23-year-old author, journalist for the New York Post, and president CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights. Not 23. And freedom. 24. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so this is um, one out of three parts of a series, the American Mind series. Barry Strauss will be here in this room next week, same time. And uh, he'll be talking about the book, The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom, who was once a professor here. And um, it's all about the introduction of postmodern thinking instead of enlightenment thinking into the university. And then today, um, oh, so um, April 11th, we're gonna um, have a, sh a screening of the movie, The Coddling of the American Mind, Ooh. made uh, um, a, a documentary film made from Greg Lukianoff and, and Jonathan Haidt's book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I saw it a few days ago. It's great. Everybody that counsels or does therapy at Cornell should be here to see it. And um, perhaps they will. Um, and today, we're going to cover The Canceling of the American Mind, the book that Greg and Ricky wrote. And um, with the coddling and the canceling, what we end up is having a really poor mental health situation where we're teaching anxiety and depression and not teaching how to differentiate what's fact and fiction, true and false, and do critical thinking. So we're set up for a horror story in terms of the university. If you ask me, the, the Cornell official theme year for free expression is really freedom from speech and emphasizes not hurting anybody's feelings. And if you try not to hurt anybody's feelings, you're bound not to think creatively in any way. So. Um, when um, a student here posted on some um, online forum um, about raping all the Jewish women and killing all the Jewish men, the administration said, I'm shocked, I'm shocked, you know, expecting every um, terrorist to be a white supremacist. But maybe exactly what we're teaching people to be that are um, that have too much anxiety and depression because they've been coddled and, and not able to check the, the veracity of their thoughts by being able to speak. They just act out like that. And I hope this series just prevents that way of thinking, that way of acting, that way of administrating a university. Oops. Okay. So I would like to um, actually, there's no two better people to bring in here. Because I think I've seen the book, and so some people are aware that somewhere designated in the scrolls of Nasisopolis, <laughs> there were the two names, Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. <laughs> and they were sent here to teach us how to argue <laughs> and how to separate fact from fiction in the search for truth. So, I'd like to begin with Greg. Why is free speech important, and why is it so important in a university? That's it. <laughs> do you, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, second of all, I mean, like, do you have, like, two weeks? Like, <laughs> this is what my, my entire career has been, uh, been devoted to this. Um, I call my substack the eternally radical idea, um, because in every generation, people stand up to oppose freedom of speech. And generally, they're on the winning side. Uh, freedom of speech is something that everyone believes in for themselves, but they tend not to believe in it for you or anyone else. It took an awful lot of thinking, an awful lot of fighting, an awful lot of blood spilt uh, and ink spilt to reach a point where you came up with norms that supported freedom of speech as a collective 
value. Now, of course, you can't have a democracy without freedom of speech. You can't have a democratic republic. Of course, some people are always like, well, we're not a democracy. It's like, yes, I know. You also can't have a democratic republic uh, w without freedom of speech. So it's a necessary precondition. So as soon as you started actually having um, representative government, of course, free speech became one of the things that they, that they wanted. Indeed, the first time people could talk to a mass audience um, with the development of the printing press, which is where I spent a lot of my time in law school studying the early origins of the printing press, people very quickly started arguing for expansive ideas of freedom of speech. Not going immediately to the universal, but that's just not the way anything works, that people go immediately from zero to universal. Um, and what I fear is that for younger people, what they hear about freedom of speech is that it's the argument of the, what I call the three Bs, the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron. And I have to explain that that is the product of a very long campaign um, of misinformation and disinformation as to why you need freedom of speech. So now I feel like I, when, when I go and actually speak to audiences, I used to just do this for high schools, I now do this for colleges as well. And I explain that, what, historically speaking, um, when it comes to the, the three Bs, that robber barons, rich people, and the rich and powerful, didn't need a special protection of freedom of speech. Why? Because they're rich and powerful. A lot of representative government comes from kings and queens going to the merchant class, begging for money and, and getting some concessions out of them to have some great influence on the way things get run. So rich people, they do fine. And when you start having representative government, um, if you are a bully or a bigot, but you have 51% of the vote, or whatever majority you actually need, you're protected too. You literally only need freedom of speech to protect on uh, minority points of view and points of view unpopular with those in power. And one of the reasons why I think this misinformation, disinformation campaign has been, been so successful among young people is that the powerful really hate to admit that they're powerful when it comes to higher education. The fact that it's a super majority of people who actually, and I'm, I, I am, I am a, I'm left of center liberal myself, and I, but I've been screaming to the heavens for this for 25 years, that essentially my side of the political fence, the political valence is switching on freedom of speech, partially because my side of the political fence dominates K through 12 education and dominates higher education. And when you're in power, you tend to see, oh, well, actually, now that we're the ones making the rules, I can see all these shortcomings of freedom of speech. And God forbid those vocal minorities should say really unpopular things. And so this has been in the works for my entire life. Um, I really start to notice it when I was at the ACLU in 1999. I call it the slow motion train wreck in the book. Um, and I feel like we're living in this moment now where powerful people are trying to convince you that free speech is the argument of the powerful, which is a nonsensical statement. So. I fear that we're in a situation, um, and the, the book that I worked on with Ricky has only made me, um, unfortunately, somewhat more pessimistic, where higher education has kind of lost the plot, particularly, particularly elite higher education um, has lost the plot on freedom of speech. You cannot meaningfully have the production of knowledge and the exploration of ideas without the freedom to dissent, not about things that are pop, uh, not about, uh, not to have opinions that are popular, but to uh, dissent as to things that, uh, that touch the, uh, the order and all the assumptions you have in any, any given institution. And I think one of the reasons why appreciation for higher education, especially at higher, higher education, has been in free fall the past couple of years is because people don't trust these institutions to be honest with them. Because if you can lose your job for having the wrong opinion on a hot button issue of the day, even if that just happens once, even if that just happens to Galileo, no one's going to listen to you anymore. And our book is filled with you know, over a thousand examples of professors being canceled and data that indicates that you're talking about tens of thousands of additional professors who have gotten in trouble for their free speech and over a million students, um, if you extrapolate the data that, that we've seen uh, well, from polling students, uh, have either been threatened with punishment or actually punished for their speech. And here's the thing, if you're in a knowledge producing environment where you can get in trouble for hypotheticals, for hypotheses, and for questioning received wisdom, nobody should trust you 
on the production of ideas. So I think that higher ed is in a much bigger crisis than it fully is even capable of understanding because it also crushes the dissent that will actually help them understand it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep, that was wonderful. I have a question for Ricky. Anybody know Mike Rowe? Yeah, yeah. Mike job. Rowe described Ricky as the smartest dropout he knew. And, a lot uh, to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so can you tell us about your experience at NYU? Yeah, um, I can also just rewind a little bit too about a lot of the trends that Greg has been observing um, for like being in this field for most of my life. Uh, I, growing up, I, I considered myself a right-leaning person in high school. Um, I said that I was a, a champion of free speech, but I can say honestly, in retrospect, if you were to hard press me to actually explain the philosophical value behind free speech or or the classical liberal principles that underpin the First Amendment, I would not have been able to do that. Um, I, not that I, I wasn't a, a good student, it's just simply not something that I was taught. In fact, I think my generation was taught precisely the opposite, that words can wound you, and that, um, that words can be violence, that, you're, that you need to be protected from expression that makes you uncomfortable and not lean into it. And I feel like there's a, like a, a sense where I don't know that my mom or my dad could explain to you the like classical liberal, what did John Stuart Mill say? But they just assumed that that was in the ether of society that, you know, um, sticks and stones into each their own and everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But the fact is that in, in my time frame of growing up, especially as a member of Gen Z, that just was not the case at all. Um, and when I got to NYU, I very much felt like I was a minority viewpoint on campus, but it really took actually the pandemic and the fact that they tried to raise tuition during Zoom school, which <laughs> my parents were like, yeah, we're not doing that. So I took a leave of absence and actually had time to read the books that I wanted to read and to engage with thinkers that I'd not been exposed to, even though I'd done two years of a, a philosophy accelerated liberal arts program at NYU. And John Stuart Mill's On Liberty was one of the first books that I'd had on my shelf, but I'd never read. And it was like everything clicked of why the First Amendment matters, why free speech is a value that's more important than just protecting my viewpoint because I feel it's under siege at NYU's campus. It, it's a much larger philosophical project and the reason that we are where we are today as a society at all, period. Um, and so that ended up bringing me to writing about my experience at NYU, um, writing for the New York Post about the issue of free speech on campus, which I had tons of people that I'd, I'd met tons of times in passing that I would never have known came to me and said, I completely agree with you. I, I share your concerns, but just don't tell anyone that I told you that, <laughs> which is pretty counterproductive. But that being at the New York Post brought me to Greg, interviewing him about whether Gen Z would be uncoddled by the pandemic, which, spoiler alert, no. <laughs> but um, then we met, that became a fellowship at FIRE, and then this book now. But I would say, by and large, my experience was at NYU. Free speech was not only not valued, but people just simply didn't understand the, the classical liberal values. And I, and I want to say, the, the, uh, I, I love that Mike Rowe uh, titled his, his piece that. I know more college dropouts than, than most people, or for that matter, people who didn't go to college at all, at all. And so I know a lot of really smart people who, 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 who dropped out of college, but Ricky is indeed the smartest one of them. I, I wholeheartedly <laughs> deny that. Okay, I'm going to withhold my applause till the end. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you changed the rules at FIRE. Yes, I did. Because you used to have a rule that you only hired college grads. Yes, which I didn't actually realize we had as a rule. So um, what do you hear about hiring college grads and especially hiring people that have gone to the Ivies? Oh, my goodness. Okay. So um, I feel like I, I, I had a, a, a very funny experience um, on a TV show called Rising, which is like the Hills Daily um, News Report, which has a um, libertarian leaning friend of mine, Robbie Suave, and a Harvard graduate, um, a pretty far left woman named Br Brianna. Bernie your supporter. Brianna Joy or something like Brianna that. Brianna Joy Gray. Joy Gray or something like that. And it was funny because I think she thought. I, she could sort of like out economic class me in terms of like talking about privilege and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, 
oh no, 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 you don't understand. Like elite higher education in particular is a class protection racket. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I'm someone who, who like, I, I, I started working when I was 11. My best friend in, at Stanford was a guy who was a construction worker for 10 years. Um, I am one of the stories that they use to indicate, oh, no, 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 we, pe people from lower classes can, can make, it, make it through here. And, and you can, we can feel really good and heartwarmed about that. But it actually turns out that when you look at the stats, yeah, there are a couple of us get through. Um, but for the most part, elite higher education in particular maintains class privilege. And I think that the uh, role of higher education in doing that has gotten worse and they've exploited you and your parents and your grandparents by charging you a lot more because if you are the single path to getting their kids on the Supreme Court, they're willing to pay any damn thing for that. And they should be, but you should also be a little more frustrated with uh, higher education for that. Now, knowing this, and, and I can go on extended class rants, and nothing, and actually being at Stanford made it worse because I hadn't met people. Um, actually, I went, to, I was a scholarship student at American University in D.C., and that was terrible because that was the kids who they couldn't buy their way into Yale and the scholarship kids. So that that made my class prejudices even worse because it seemed like all of the poor people were smart and hardworking, and all of the rich kids were dumb and lazy. And then I got to Stanford. And I got to meet all these decent, hardworking, rich folk, um, which I hadn't actually experienced before. But it was still very much a, a class bubble. So what am I getting at? I think that, um, and there's, there's a great book called Poison Ivy on this. The evidence is even worse than he, than he, he lays out, it turns out, um, about how particularly Ivies and elite higher education actually maintain, uh, maintain class privilege. And even though I go on about this all the time, I didn't actually realize that my own organization that I've been the head of for 23 years um, had a, a rule of not hiring people who didn't, ha uh, who didn't have bachelor degrees. And as soon as I found out that we couldn't hire Ricky because she didn't have a bachelor's degree, I was like, well, that's hypocritical. And we immediately got rid of it. But, but I think that one of the ways out of the current situation we're in is we need a lot fewer jobs to require bachelor's degrees. Um, it is a way of protecting class privilege. Um, it is not fair. It is not equitable. If, that's, uh, if you care about equity, it's one of the least equitable practices out there. So I think that there are less expensive ways to show how smart and hardworking you are. I think apprentices, should, uh, we go through a lot of solutions that I think would actually make the, situ the situation better. Um, the special problem of elite higher education, though. After Coddling in the American Mind came out, my book with Jonathan Haidt in 2018, um, the uh, uh, leaders, business leaders from all throughout the country started get, coming to us and saying that they were having trouble with their new graduates. Uh, and, and in fact, actually one of my wife's like, really good friends um, uh, immediately wrote me, choosing her words quite, uh, quite cruelly, wrote, I want to have a word with you about your new book. And, sh and she worked at a very lefty nonprofit that did direct services for poor, uh, uh, for poor people and, and, uh, and also did a lot of homeless advocacy. So I'm like, oh, God, she's going she's gonna to kill me. Like, like, you know, um, but I think she made it sound like she was going to. And actually what she told me was, yeah, our nonprofit is completely paralyzed by the new hires. Every small interaction that goes slightly negatively between them and other their fellow students becomes something that paralyzes HR. It stops us from actually helping the people we're there to help. It, every mountain is a molehill, with but guaranteed. And then that started happening every you know couple of weeks since Coddling came out in 2018. And I've been told by business leaders all over the country. I don't hire from the Ivy League anymore because I can't be guaranteed that they're really the best and brightest anymore. And I might get someone who wants me to cancel some of my talent, um, who doesn't want to work with an IT guy if they find out they voted for Trump or, God forbid, even said anything like they might. Um, and that's dysfunctional. And every time they say this to me, I'm like, can you please tell the world that? Because it might actually help some of these institutions that, by the way, we rely way too much on, Cornell. <laughs> That we, will, that we rely way too much on, that they uh, that, that it might encourage them to reform. Because I am resigned to the fact that you guys have way too much money to be gone next week. So like knowing that Stanford, Yale, Harvard, Cornell are going to be around in a while, it also makes sense to reform them. But they were all t they all were like, no, that would make us look too bad if we said that we were having this kind of trouble with our elite college graduates and we weren't. But that's increasingly eroding. 
particularly in the last couple of months, a lot more business leaders are like, nope, I am going to go to big state schools. I'm going to figure out other ways to get the best and brightest. And by the way, they won't come with the issue of they can't work with people they disagree with. So I think that, again, you know, I, I am being fairly hard on the Ivy League. Ivy League does terribly in the campus free speech ranking that we do, but it's not as if just elite colleges um, that they're doomed to do badly. University of Virginia finished in the top 10 for us um, uh, in our free speech ranking, and I explained the methodology there. It's, uh, it, it's, I'm very, it, it's a very impressive methodology. Um, University of Chicago was 13th. Um, you know, Auburn was second. Uh, Michigan Technological University, by the way, number one, which was interesting, um, in, you know, finding there. Harvard got a negative 10.69, the first negative score we ever got in our history. They finished 248 out of 248, and boy, did they earn it, uh, <laughs> earn, earn that. So Ivy League not doing so hot on the campus free speech ranking. I can explain more about the methodology if, if you'd like me to, but... Yeah, I might also just add on the, the question about changing hiring standards and, and the shifting attitudes. I dropped out in 2021 officially, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, like, the perfect example of, of class mobility. And, you know, I went to a boarding school. I'm not, like, this was, I'm from a, an environment where that was just expected. Um, and oftentimes whenever I, I would tell someone or they'd say, oh, how is NYU going or what's going on? I'm like, oh, I'm not, not finishing. I'm working full time now. It's like, oh, what, oh, went, what went wrong with you? must have a heroin problem. Like, yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's something up. Someone got an F or has a bad roommate or whatever. And that has changed gradually. Even in, in hiring processes and, and different jobs that I've taken um, in the past, uh, it's it was gradual in terms of people being a little more open-minded to the fact that, I mean, I, I, I say that the reason that I decided not to go back to NYU is because I just didn't feel ideologically um, inspired, nor did I feel ideologically supported there. Um, and a lot of people, I think, for a while thought that I was the type of culture warrior who might have seen, like, one too many gender-neutral bathrooms and just bailed. But that's certainly, especially in, since October and in recent events on campuses, I would say that it's been a sea change where people suddenly seem, and in the outside world, to understand what some people have been warning about for, for quite a while in terms of um, just a lack of, of viewpoint diversity and civil discourse on campuses. Um, and so it's... It's definitely the sentiment. It being a dropout is far less of a stigma than it used to be. I would say. And I mean, how many of us have had the experience of like the situation where you actually read a bunch of books for pleasure and learn infinitely more than you did in the class where you were supposed to read those books? Mm. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Uh, some people don't believe that this cancel culture. Since we have Bill Jacobson here and David Collum. And, uh, and Russell Rickford, too. We, we can, um, we're pretty aware that there's a cancel culture at Cornell. And, um, but Ricky, you have such a nice story about talking about Chris Harrison. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell us his story? Oh, um, with Chris Harrison? Yeah. Or, um, Was he the guy from Survivor? For um, The Bachelor? Do you mean, oh, The Bachelor. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Not <laughs> academic. Yeah, Chris Harrison. Um, I think it was probably to me. It seems like a like a little blip in the culture wars, and you know, The Bachelor is not the most intellectual endeavor in the world. We cover a lot of stories. In the yeah, world. but this is actually. <laughs> yeah. I, I I agree with you, but you're the only other person who's really felt as strongly as I did about that <laughs> experience as a admitted Bachelor girly, but no longer <laughs> since he's been canceled. Um, but there was a a scandal on The Bachelor in the. 2020 season where I believe the girl who won this season, she was one of the female contestants with one bachelor. She, a photo had resurfaced of her. I'm like kind of roughly estimating the ages, but I think she was probably like 26 at the time. And a photo from when she was 18 or 19 and a student at a state school in the South resurfaced where she had attended a fraternity's party that was antebellum themed. And she was pictured with a group of girls in um, like a cheap costume version, uh, just as a participant in, uh, in this sorority event. Um, and the photo resurfaced while the season was airing and she ended up being just summarily torn down, I think in the heat of the moment of 2020, um, based on a photo of her as a teenager. And she 
pretty quickly came out to apologize and said, this is, you know, I did not understand the context. I, I was just a, an attendee. If I could do it over again, I wouldn't do that. However, there was a period of time where she had not publicly commented. I think it was like a day or two later and Chris Harrison was interviewed. He was the host of The Bachelor, had been there for like two decades. And he was interviewed about like, what do you, what do you say about this? Like, I mean, or do you condemn this contestant? And he said, you know, I, I can't speak for her. Um, she, she was a, a, a young person at the time. I want to wait and give her some space and give her some grace. He even used the word grace to come out and make a statement on her own. But I think that we need to lean towards tolerance and, and letting her come out and say, um, you know, what, how she feels about this. And I'm not going to be the one. I can't remember the, the exact quote that he used, but it was something about like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to lead the mob on this girl. Um, and he ended up, she ended up apologizing and being relatively fine and ending up with The Bachelor. But he ended up getting squeezed out of The Bachelor for just saying, I think that we should give this girl some grace and some time to actually come yeah, out and speak a, a for herself. The first, don't so, cast the first stone speech is what got him canceled. Yeah, I mean, so I think when, if we're in a world where asking for grace and and leaning towards forgiveness is in itself a cancelable offense, when you're not even the person who did the controversial thing, I think that's um, a really frightening precedent. But most people dismiss that example. Uh, I'm surprised <laughs> you were so impacted by it. So also, <laughs> you, you want to make sure the word grace got in the book. Uh, yeah, she, uh, absolutely. Ricky had to explain to me what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> Greg had, Greg had edited it out in one version, and I was like, no, I think that grace, I mean, I, I'm Christian, and, and Greg is not religious, but I don't think, it, I don't mean it in a, um, in a, with a religious valence at all. It's just a, a lending someone the benefit of the doubt and um, treating them in their moment of, of perhaps a misstep in a way that you would like to be treated, too. Yeah, no, I actually didn't know, know what the word meant. And the reason it meant so much to me is because the whole inclusion and belonging, um, whatever you call it, just lacks grace. You know, people are canceled like this. They're, um, God, femtosecond. <laughs> and, and you begin the canceling of the mind um, by talking, uh, well, Jonathan Haidt in yeah. the preface talks about the three great untruths. Mm -hmm. And will you make sure that we all here know the three great untruths. Uh, sure. Yeah, and, and the story about the three great untruths is that Haidt and I start working on, we, we wrote the original article in 2015, basically saying, wow, we're, we're teaching young people the mental habits of anxious and depressed people. We actually started working it in 2014, and it's going to be a threat to academic freedom and free speech, but also going to be really devastating for people who believe um, at, at, in these ideas. And that ended up being much, much worse um, than we were expecting. So. We were proud of the article, didn't think we needed to write a book, then things got so much worse we decided to write a book. And in the process of researching it, we got so in the weeds and we were so, we got very much into like a lot of the theory, the intersectionality and all this kind of stuff. And at some point I, 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 I tell John, John, we're starting to write a book that I don't want to read. <laughs> and so we tried to rethink about how we do it and kind of the idea with it was, I'm gonna, let's give advice the way I give, like my family gives advice. We know that, uh, you know, I'm a Russian Irish family, um, that they don't, nobody's going to tell, if, if um, I, I, I tell my sister Alexandra, uh, Alexandra Lukyanova, like uh, what to do, um, she's not gonna listen to me. But if I make a joke about what she absolutely should not do, she might listen to that. So we give negative advice for the most part of my family. We basically like make a joke out of like what you shouldn't do. So in the book, we decided to open it up by going to a guru um, and we're seeking wisdom and instead we get three of the worst pieces of advice we ever heard in our lives. And the idea is that like all, all three of them, uh, they reject ancient wisdom and they go against modern psychology and they will make you miserable if you believe these three things. And one is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Uh, two is always trust your feelings. That's the one that sounds nice until you think about it for a second. Um, there's no wisdom tradition that's like, oh yeah, just go for it. Um, part three, uh, great untruth number three is life is a battle between good people and evil people. And that was a great disappointment to me because I felt like most of my life was learning greater moral sophistication about individuals having uh, you know, goodness and evil in, in, inside of every heart. And for 
canceling the American mind, we actually added a fourth, is that no, good, uh, no, no bad person has any good opinion. And basically, it's to make the point that it kind of builds on three, but essentially the way we argue, particularly on campus, is to, I can point out that you're a bad person, and therefore, all your opinions are now invalid. Which is sorry to point for you. I don't mean but it's to. true. Um, <clears throat> all, all your opinions are therefore um, invalid, and it's a it's you know forgive the expression, but it's a BS way to argue. So we actually added a fourth grade untruth in canceling. And um, you also mentioned that parents and educators teach these three great untruths. Yeah. So the fact that. We as educators are teaching this. Often by example, uh, in, in a lot of cases, in some cases I have seen flat out, absolutely. I've seen some of the anti-bullying programming th that came out after 2010 where it's kind of like life, <laughs> you know, you'll be permanently damaged by words, um, always trust your feelings no matter what, and, um, uh, and life is divided into just bullies and anti-bullies. And of course, like, it's not that simple. When I think about like the like the biggest bullies growing up, a lot of them were really troubled kids. Like it wasn't that it was never that simple. Um, and of course, like what ends up happening now in a lot of campuses, a lot of uh, high schools, the, the way Ricky grew up was that guess what? Kids are socially smart, and they're still going to exert aggression against each other and social aggression. And if the rules are that basically, if you're going to be pushing, um, you know, a, a, a seventh grade girl around and you really want it to stick, the new rules are, make it look like you're virtuous when you're doing it. Sound familiar? <laughs> in, in your book, you talk about the perfect rhetorical fortress and the efficient um, rhetorical fortress. Can you, well, the efficient one, you can tell us quickly. Yeah. But um, will you tell us a little bit about um, also the, the perfect rhetorical fortress and how they prevent conversation? Hmm. So um, we divide, we have two chapters in our book um, talking about metaphorical fortresses of just these, these constructions that we all, I think, um, regardless of, of how, tr how hard we try to pull ourselves out of the, the social norms of, of thinking today, uh, find ourselves trapped in one or the other. So we have one on the right and one on the left. Um, and we call the left wing's rhetorical fortress the perfect rhetorical fortress because we think that it's a, a very cavernous and um, well-constructed, multi-walled sort of uh, castle to, to wall yourself in from viewpoints that you dislike or that you might be hostile to. Um, and so we have barrier after barrier of um, reasons, mostly ad hominem reasons, of, of why you wouldn't have to listen to an argument not because of what the argument is on face value, but because of who the speaker is. And so we go through the kind of demographical funnel of, uh, is the speaker male? Are they white? Are they cisgendered? And all these different reasons where you can say, you know, if, if you hear a viewpoint that you don't like, you say, oh, well, that's just a cishet white male viewpoint that you have here. <laughs> Um, and so on the, on the left, we believe that we wall ourselves in, or we believe that people on the left are walling themselves in from having to hear competing viewpoints oftentimes because they, they ascribe that view or the, or, um, the value of the speaker uh, themselves to immutable characteristics. Um, and so I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I just want to, want to add one thing. We, 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 take, we take people down the demographic funnel. Um, oh, and the first one is, can, I, I, and, I, and this one I've, uh, after the book, started calling fascio casting, which is, and what I mean by casting is like casting a spell. That essentially, like, t tactic number one is I disagree with you, and therefore you're a fascist. Um, magically, you, um, <laughs> they, you, you're made one, or a right winger, or a conservative, or like whatever, and I don't have to listen to you anymore. Which is how you end up in the ridiculous situation of people now calling the ACLU and the New York Times right wing because they, they print things sometimes that the left doesn't like, which is a real thing, by the way. Um, it, it actually, um, uh, Marianne Franks, who I believe spoke here, um, has called them neo-Confederates or their dupes because apparently calling them fascists wasn't good enough. Um, so it's just increased insult technology. But the cool thing about the demographic funnel, the demographic funnel is that even if you, uh, and we, we actually, uh, and Height told me not to do this, but I had to do it because people are really bad on demographics, like actually working out like how much of the population you're instantly eliminating if you just go down the demographic funnel. And by the time you get to non-white transgender people, you're talking about, you know, maybe 0.5 to 0.9% of the population. So congratulations, you've eliminated 99.91%, uh, but they must that by their own standards, that must mean that if you're a non-white trans person, they're going to totally listen to you no matter what your opinion are. Not a chance. 
And one of the things that we, 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 we quote is, are actually some trans activists saying, okay, well, it actually turns out that if, um, even if I am, I, I fit all the boxes on intersectionality, I uh, get even worse scorn for having the wrong argument because then it's internalized transphobia, it's internalized racism, it's internalized misogyny. I'm pointing at Ricky because she gets accused of this <laughs> a lot. So that's why it's perfect. And because that's just level six, you know, like, like it's just layer after layer of ways to, uh, excuses not to have to listen to, to somebody um, that let you off the hook. Um, and I think it's, and it's particularly embarrassing that some of these tactics are respected at all in higher ed. And I think it's worse than that. I think they teach some of these habits. Anyway, so do you want to talk about the rhetorical, uh, the, the efficient rhetorical? Yeah, um, so on the opposite side of that, we also like definitely don't believe that those on the right are, are completely immune from walling themselves in. And I can, I, there's some self-recognition, honestly, in um, the ways that I used to think in our efficient rhetorical fortress, but uh, we think that it's efficient because it's, it's not honed in academia in the same way that this kind of complex left-wing identity politics way of insulating yourself is. It's just simply as someone, uh, a liberal, are they an expert? Are they a journalist? Or in, for some people, are they critical of Trump? And if they check any of those boxes, then you don't have to engage with them either. And I think, you know, it sounds like a silly exercise to be talking about, like, metaphorical constructions but in a, in a sense it's that's how silly our discourse is is that we're talking past each other and we're going down these um, identity politics rabbit holes before actually addressing anyone's argument and it makes for a lot of screaming and yelling and talking past each other but ultimately it absolves us all from the responsibility of actually reaching across the aisle and engaging with people with different viewpoints or engaging with people whose viewpoints uh, might make us uncomfortable thanks Greg, I want to talk to you about K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed as a professor that in the past 10 years or so, students want to know what to think, not how to mm -hmm. think. And if I say, if I told you this sweater were red and I gave you a test, there's one question on the test. Yep. What color is my sweater? 95% of Cornell students will say red. <laughs> and, um, and it just, the truth just doesn't matter. So um, well, it matters, and oftentimes they know it. Just they know, like you know, they know that they, 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 they've been skinnerized into you know. I'll tell me what you want me to say yeah. because they've they've grown up with tell me what you want what yeah. me to say. So um, will you describe what's happened in K through twelve education in your ideas to make a positive change? Yeah. So I have a I have a eight year old named Benjamin and a six year old named Maxwell and um, they are in public school in Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get looks of horror sometimes when I explain this. And it's like, no, but I want, I want my kids to be able to go to public school, uh, but I do know that I have kind of, you know, I'm probably not the most popular person at that school for, 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 for what I've written. The, for the teachers who actually do know me tend, tend to like me, but I'm, there's some that I'm sure don't, they hate my guts. Um, and I think that we've done an awful lot wrong in, in K through 12. And I think a lot of that comes from problems in existing education schools going back decades. I mean, there, there were some of like the biggest, um, you know, like so, some of the leaders in, in, like, uh, um, uh, at the Teachers College, at Columbia Teachers College, you know, 25 years ago, picking on the entire industry for um, be, having basically no viewpoint diversity whatsoever, being really low on rigor and very high on ideology. And this, was, uh, and this was just 25 years ago that people were making this argument. Um, and it, the people were making the same argument back in the 1960s about education schools. Um, so, and I, and I, I try to f focus on the schools partially because I want to be really clear. Some of the nicest, kindest, most compassionate people I know go to education schools. And they can be incredible teachers, they can be, they can be great, but I think the, the, what they're actually learning that sounds compassionate and sounds nice are things like the three grid intrudes. They are this very therapized way of looking at the world. Um, you know, it, there's, a, there's a book that just came out by someone who everyone tries to cancel all the time, but it's an excellent book um, called Bad Therapy by Abigail Schreier. And you know, don't cancel me for mentioning her as, a great, as being really good on this topic. But so far, I think she's entirely right. 
And I am someone who has struggled with depression and anxiety throughout my life. Coddling the American Mind is the product of me being suicidally depressed in 2007 and a real genuine danger to myself. I have benefited tremendously from cognitive behavioral therapy. But people forget that if you frame everything as, are you okay? Are you really okay? Are you okay? Are, are, are you sure? That you're framing things mentally with people that's basically causing them to look for what's wrong with them, and it's like whispering into their ears, by the way, you can't really handle this over and over again. And that's what I think we're doing to young people. And it sounds initially like it's compassionate until you think about it a little bit longer. So I think K through 12 education needs a lot of fixing. I came out um, in the book as actually being pro uh, vouchers, you know, actually thinking that, that we need some major shakeups here. Um, and I have something that I called, because I'm stuck with a shtick, something called the empowering of the American mind, which are principles for, higher, uh, for K through 12 reform that I think are incompatible with, with some of these ideas. But I think we need just a lot more experimentation in this place. I think we need a lot more options for parents. I think the fact that so many uh, student parents have moved to homeschooling it used to be considered a very fringy thing and a lot of uh, otherwise, you know, uh, normal parents are actually doing it these days. I, I, I think that we're headed towards something where the situation is not sustainable and all of these efforts to improve the mental health of young people have helped not just, it, not just it's happened in spite of those efforts, but I do increasingly think because of some of the wrongheadedness of those efforts, we have le it has led to us to a genuine mental health disaster for young people. And if I might go back to the fact that your sweater is red, I would have said as much when I was a student at NYU, <laughs> which is really embarrassing to say in retrospect. But I mean, I, I went to the Lawrenceville School, which is a, a boarding school. I, I moved there when I was 14. I was socially concerned of like, I, I wanted people to like me. I wanted my teachers to like me. I wasn't politically activated yet. And yet there was a highly politicized curriculum. Now that I look back at some of the things that I was assigned and I look back at old essays that I was writing. And even though I wasn't politically aware or activated, s certain political beliefs that I would today challenge or I would hope would be presented to me as one of many viewpoints were presented to me as fact. And when you're a 14 year old who doesn't know the first thing about politics and is worried about boys and acne and fitting in, you're not really going to be there with your punching gloves with your teacher. And I think that there's a point in time where you do mature and you do become an adult who should be intellectually autonomous. But if you're not taught those habits, you can end up at a, a place like where I was before the pandemic, where I, I had a 4.0 at NYU. I wanted to go to law school. I, that was my career path that I had in mind. And in order to get to the next rung of education and to maintain my 4.0 and to not rock the boat and to not invite friction and social penalty on myself, I probably would have said that your sweater is red and then went home and like complained about it to, to a friend that agreed with me politically, which is embarrassing to say. I want, want, want to add uh, two things. I would say that the only thing that ever breaks my heart a little bit about uh, about uh, Ricky um, dropping out of school, because otherwise I think it's such a great idea, is what a kick-ass lawyer she would make. Um, and like, but still, she can you know take the bar. The bar is not the bar is a weird exam. It's definitely something that you could pass in, in your sleep. Um, but the uh, you don't have to have. I'm being hyped to pass up way too much. No, 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 that, but but the. Um, uh, well, actually, you still have to study for it because it's like a lot of, anyway, uh, that's the bar. But one thing I did want you to talk about, though, which I, which I always found so interest, in, interesting was because, you know, like we, we have this definition of cancel culture being the uptick of campaigns to get people punished, deplatformed, fired, etc., for speech that would be protected under the First Amendment, by which, in order to make it a short definition with lots of, um, lots of nuance, we, we're, we try to be pretty clear we're talking about as an analogy to public employee law, which in, introduces a lot of common sense into what we mean, what you can and can't get fired for. But in the process of saying that, that's partially because like, that's what the data indicates. It really, the uptick began in 2014. That's what it felt like on the ground. That's what we were seeing on the ground. But we did this podcast like after dozens like uh, of podcasts and Ricky was kind of like yeah I always found it kind of funny that we talk about 2014 because I, I I grew up with it and, and I want you to yeah. talk a little because you you were like patient zero basically mm -hmm. for this stuff yeah totally um I mean I was coming uh to like the age of political awareness at the same time that cancel culture and like this degradation of discourse unfolded in our society and 
I don't really remember a time before it. I can like vaguely recall um, growing up when you could talk to someone who had a different political viewpoint from you without uh, just going at them completely ad hominem or dismissing them or um, cutting them away from like the, the Thanksgiving table. And I think that partisanship and just the, the lack of classical liberal values in our society right now is just kind of what I came to get used to. Um, and I think that's also part of why, even though Gen Z is often at the, the forefront of these cancel culture campaigns, I think it's extremely important to underscore the fact that Gen Z has the most negative view of cancel culture of any generation, not because they understand the like philosophical value of free speech, but because they know how terrible it is to grow up in a, a world where your teenage mistakes or your experimentation with ideas um, or your faux pas or a text that you sent to a friend that you forgot about can blow up your life and your social reputation. Um, and so I think that young people actually do feel that there's something wrong in our discourse and they are self-censoring and they are questioning themselves in a way that is preventing them from being fully authentic, but they just don't have the tools to course correct. Thank you. In your book, you, you, um, you quote one of my other heroes, um, Jonathan Roche. Oh, yeah. In Kindly Inquisitors. He wrote, a very dangerous principle is now being established as a social right. Thou shalt not hurt others with words. This principle is a menace, and not just to civil liberties. At bottom, it threatens liberal inquiry, that is, science itself. And Kimberly Crenshaw, who wrote Words That Wound, gave the Martin Luther King commemorative, Jr. commemorative um, talk this year at Cornell. And um, of course, she came up with the idea of critical race theory and intersectionality that were the foundations of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm just wondering, Greg, does DEI require that there be a double standard when it comes to free speech at universities? Um, yes. I mean, flat out, it, 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 it's, it's pretty unapologetic about the idea that life is about power and that there are the powerful and, the, um, and there, are the, the, there are the oppressed and there are the oppressors. And that takes on moral valence, as we talk about in Coddling the American Mind, that there are, you know, um, good, uh, bad oppressors and, and, and good, uh, morally, more, more virtuous oppressed people. And this is a very basic historical human narrative about ourselves, that essentially we are not individuals, we are members of groups. I mean, this is all um, a, f a funny detail about me. My dad was born in, 19, uh, in 1926 in Yugoslavia. His father died when he was six, so he had the misfortune of being an orphan in Yugoslavia in the 1930s. So he was all over the place, and he would, t he would tell me as a kid, you know, and he still has a little bit of a Russian accent. He'd be, my son, they will all just start killing each other as soon as they are allowed to. I was like, <laughs> oh, dad, you're so dark and Russian. Like, that's, you know, that's, they, they've been stable for decades. Like, this isn't gonna, and of course, as soon as they were allowed to, this is what started happening. And that is a story of who's oppressing me, who in the right, who are the virtuous people, who are the Christianin, which is the Russian word for peasant, uh, who are the boyars, you know, like, and who actually has moral valence. This is an old idea that gets dressed up as if it's a new and sophistic uh, sophisticated idea. And under the current understanding of DEI, it is this simple, simplistic, moralistic script. Now, people like Andrew Sullivan and, and Ricky as well have made a great point that if you really follow intersectionality down the rabbit hole, you end up with individuality. That if you take every single factor of your um, of who you are right down to your molecular makeup, yes, we're individuals, but that's not what DEI uh, is actually saying. So, and here's one of the things that really has to be understood to un understand like why a lot of us are very concerned about DEI. DEI has great a great name. Um, I, agree. I I think diversity is incredibly important. I think equality is, is extremely important. Equity is you know something that Russia was trying to do and it didn't work out so well. Uh, inclusivity, I believe, uh, in in a big big way. Um, but that's not what the ideology actually means. And it's by its very nature, and, and it's been weird watching you know some people trying to rectify what's been going on on campus, particularly with regards to anti-Semitism, that maybe just include Jewish students in intersectionality somehow. 
And the answer is, it can't. It's always going to be a situation that actually requires some people being uh, moral and some people being immoral as groups, not as individuals. So I don't think the EI can actually be reformed. And the single most important thing for people to understand from an academic freedom and free speech um, a perspective is that case after case we've seen on campus have been either facilitated by, uh, directly encouraged by, outright organized by DEI administrators at various schools, including my alma mater, Stanford Law School. So it's been weird watching people come to the defense of the academic freedom um, of universities to have DEI offices and about how it's important to respect that when it's kind of like, so you're making an argument f based in academic freedom for not shutting down your censorship department, essentially. <laughs> And that it doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Like uh, what, 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 when you think about it, I did I did a debate on PBS uh, NewsHour with with a diversity consultant. But I, I really do think people need to understand that when it comes to sort of orthodoxy problems that we have on campuses, a lot of these happen from the fact that we have explicitly ideological administrators on campus. W one last thing on this: the problem is not just DEI administrators, though. The problem is the mass bureaucratization of higher education and people who believe that it's their job to police what students say to each other, what, what they say, um, what, what, they, what their professors say, etc. And if you decide to go after DEI administrators, they're just going to change what they're called. And that's what they did 10 years ago. Um, and that's what they'll continue to do if basically it turns out we're just going, and I think the only solution is massively debureaucratizing a lot of universities, but there is very little appetite for this, uh, particularly in the, well, country club that is elite higher education. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ricky, you've written lately about the cesspools of bigotry that universities have become in terms of anti-Semitism that became obvious in October 7th. Would you like to tell us yeah. something about that? I mean, I think that one thing that I, I've been thinking about a lot in terms of um, the reaction post-October 7th on campuses is that when you're a student who wants to feel edgy and that you're, fr you're pushing the next frontier like every young activist does, and like in the past decade or so with student activists, you know, Trump would get elected and so they'd want to protest and so the administrators would say, oh, okay, your classes are canceled so that you, you, can, you can go protest. Or, you know, at some schools you have administrators organizing buses, busloads of kids to go to protest that they want to feel edgy and transgressive about. And consistently, I think we were in a scenario where young people wanted to push the edge and wanted to, to be politically on the cutting edge and, and wanted to push the buttons of the powers that be in society and yet they were just getting the thumbs up um, from the teachers and administrators and professors around them and I really do feel that in the the past few months for, at least for some student activists who don't have a personal connection to that part of the world and are not really well informed on the history there who have taken such particular interest um, in, in protesting and oftentimes deeply illiberal and concerning and dangerous ways by crossing the threshold of what protected speech is um, on campuses across the country, I think that there is a desire to, to actually ruffle feathers and to push boundaries in a way that students have discovered they can on this issue, that this does um, actually push the next frontier in, in the most transgressive cause. And I, I think that as a result, we've seen some really ugly ad hominem um, bigoted events happen on, on across campuses across the country, for sure. Yeah. And it's been, it, it, and it's one of these things where, you know, I just had an interview in the, in the Hill um, n newspaper in, in DC, and I live on Capitol Hill, so it was kind of, kind of neat. Um, and I talk about what the secret motto of FIRE is, my organization. And fire was tiny, there were six of us, um, and it was just after 9-11, and there was a professor who Bill O'Reilly had discovered had, in a video, said death to Israel back in 1989. Um, but really what Bill O'Reilly was going after this particular professor for, his name was Samuel Arian, was for having ties to, uh, to, to the, the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic Jihad. Um, but University of South Florida had done a, uh, a whitewash of this 
you know, a couple uh, years before, and they didn't want to admit that there might have actually been some validity to that. So what they decided to do was fire Samuel Arian for saying, and I, it was a very offensive thing to say, but saying death to Israel in the 80s. And as soon as that was the case, Fire was like, okay, this is a Fire case. And we were so small, and we were so new, and we had so few donors that we realized um, that I remember actually, you know, being in my office and being like, we're going to drive this bus into a wall if we have to. <laughs> Um, like, we're, we will not be unprincipled, and if that's how, this is how we go down, this is how we go down. And that's become the secret motto of FIRE forever. Um, and, and actually, I just said that aloud um, uh, in an interview, and now everyone knows what the secret motto is. <laughs> we, we have a lot of, there's been a lot of unsympathetic speech that comes out of October 7th, and definitely we've had people saying, well, students are calling for genocide. And to be clear, I think some students really are freaking calling for genocide. I think there are student activists who, who are unapologetically, they want mass murder. Um, I also think that there are a lot of students who are saying intifada, making it basically just means resist, and saying from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, without actually think, knowing what the river and the sea is. And this was actually put to the test, by the way, by the Wall Street Journal, that showed um, some of the students uh, what the map actually looks like. Here's the river, here's the sea, and they actually weren't aware of the fact that that's the entire state of Israel. Um, and so I think in a lot of cases, these students who are in many cases looking to be edgy, like they don't think they're saying, uh, saying genocide. Although actually I think some of them do know they're saying that. So we've been defending you know, students, even when they're saying highly offensive things for, for our, in, uh, our entire existence. I do think we're at a little bit of a watershed, though, because this is something that even the left, which completely dominates higher education, disagrees within itself. Um, and I, I think that that's creating an, op an opportunity for people to go like, what, what exactly has happened here that we have this overly simplistic narrative about things in the most, one of the most complicated parts of the world. And part of the answer there is that we've been teaching young people in, in, situ in institutions that are supposed to make them more sophisticated thinkers overly um, simplistic narratives about good versus evil when we could have been teaching them something much more profound. And I think people are pretty horrified um, at what they're seeing, at what passes for discourse to, to, today in higher ed. And I hope the one thing that, the good thing that I hope comes out of this is we take the moment to figure out better, cheaper, higher rigor ways of doing this whole entire enterprise because I, 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 the, the saddest thing we found from our research was the fact that um, the younger professors, basically like I'm Gen X um, and boomers and Gen X, statistically speaking, uh, left, right, center, are all good on freedom of speech. Uh, particularly as you get older for the most part in the United States, you're, you're, you're good on free speech. Um, the younger professorate has less viewpoint diversity. They're less good on academic freedom and free speech. I mean, one of the most horrifying things we found in our studies of, of DEI statements is that we asked professors, do you think DEI statements, mandatory DEI statements are political litmus tests? And we also asked them separately if we thought they were a good idea and appropriate. What we didn't expect was to get nearly 25% of professors saying, yes, there are political litmus tests, and yes, they're appropriate. We didn't think those two would go together, let alone for about a quarter of students, uh, professors. And that was wildly disproportionately the younger professorate. So things are, things are gonna get worse, frankly. And that's one of the reasons why we have to take advantage of a moment of lucidity to be kind of like, don't we wanna do something about this? And I, I am skeptical that universities are really going to stand up for free speech. I don't think they really want it that much anymore. I, th I, I think they want to invite speakers who accuse um, people who are pro-free speech of being neo-confederates and coming out with increasingly advanced insult technology um, to not take any issue other than the ones they like seriously. Thanks. I didn't know if I'd have enough questions, so I reached out to Cornellians all around the world. And the A.D. White professor, um, John Cleese, sent a question for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing John Cleese on Monday, by the way. It, it's really weird. He likes me. And I'm half British, so it's kind of like the, I, I grew up a lot over there. Like, so he's like God to me, and I have to interview him on Monday. And see, Latin grammar. What's that? Ask about Latin grammar. <laughs> I might. And actually tell him that when I opened my email one morning and saw John Cleese, oh, God. it was like, 
How did he know I was speaking here? <laughs> no, Bert told him. Oh, got it. Okay. A sense of humor depends on the ability to comprehend a change of context. <laughs> People who are literal minded cannot do this well, hence their inability to fully appreciate humor and for that matter, poetry. So, should they be able to censor material that people who do have a sense of humor <laughs> are able to understand and enjoy? Seems to me a bit like people who are very short-sighted being allowed to decide what people with 2020 vision should be able to look at. This is, this is a favorite argument of his, um, and, and actually it's one of the things we're going to be talking about on Monday. And yeah, no, like, like the idea that kind of like the humor list gets to decide what the people who actually have a good sense of humor get to say has been a problem throughout, uh, throughout history. Now, unfortunately, um, what usually res uh, was the result of um, the humor list trying to censor people who are actually funny is the Streisand effect, that essentially, like, uh, that it, uh, they're, they're one of the best ways to make sure your book was a bestseller was to get banned in Boston, literally. Because they, they had such blue noses in Boston that essentially if you had something, a slightly racy book with a little tiny bit of sex in it, um, it would get banned in Boston and suddenly your, your sales would go through the roof. I do think that we've probably short-circuited that. But once you have enough blue noses in any given society, you lose that effect to a degree. And, and, and I fear that, um, uh, that in some aspects, some of the, a lot of the work I see indicates that um, we've lost our sense of humor in some campuses entirely. John ended with, give my love to Greg oh. and tell him I'm reading his book whenever writing emails allows me. <laughs> so I would like to open the floor to questions. So question one, how dare you? There's always the one I expect. <laughs> uh, I'm really close to you, so I don't know if I need this too much. But yeah. I mean, uh, thanks. I, like, I, I was pointing at your shirt because it just says Canada. Like, yeah, just, just an Canada. advertisement for Canada. I, well, it says Montreal a little. And I got oh, it does? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love Montreal. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. more specific. <laughs> this is like United States. College. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, if I was sorry. Canadian, it would be great. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, did you guys are at Cornell, I don't know how much you guys have been hearing about like the interim expressive policy yes. and all that. I was just wondering kind of what you guys think about it, um, just in terms of mitigating free speech and kind of how it goes along with this theme year we're having here, um, which is, I guess, the reason why you guys are here. Yeah, we, we, we wrote something, um, we wrote a letter to Cornell objecting to the new interim free speech policy. Um, my, uh, Laura Belts, my... Um, speech code analyst uh, wrote something about it in the fire uh, on the fire website, pointing out like what our issues are with it. Now, I, I was told that there was th some stuff about whether or not you're allowed to use amplification equipment. You know, when it comes to general free speech principles, things like that are viewpoint neutral and um, and, and they're about things that are um, not that have no regard to content, like how loud something is. That there are some additional allowances for things like that, but. I personally haven't analyzed the policy myself, but I know that Laura, who's generally right on these things, ha has objected to it. So I have a quick question. Uh, so you mentioned you studied different institutes. What was the basic of the that is study? So it's a freedom of a speech. What rubric you used? That's the first question. And the second one, for those institutes that they received a lower ranking, yeah. have you found any common denominator? Uh huh. Okay. So the campus free speech ranking, people. So Fire celebrates 25 years of existence this year, and since I started at Fire as legal director uh, in 2001 and became president in 2006, um, people have been asking me to do a ranking of freedom of speech. But thankfully, since I, you know, co-author of Colleague in the American Mind, you can tell that I take my research actually very seriously, and I want, and I would not agree to do one until we actually could do something with a high degree of rigor. So the campus free speech ranking is based on the largest study of student opinion on freedom of speech ever done. And we ask a, a variety of different factors. So for example, if you have a high percentage of students saying that violence is acceptable in response to a speaker you don't like, you get a ding for that. Also, if they're saying that I'm terrified of speaking to my fellow students about opinions that I disagree with, you get a ding for that. I'm terrified of talking to my professors. Um, you, you, you get uh, marked down for that. Meanwhile, if you have the opposite, uh, you, you, you get plus factors for that. The thing that will take you down the most as of right now 
is, say, firing a tenured professor for exercising their free speech or academic freedom. That's the biggest ding you can get. Having bad policies on the books for freedom of speech gives you a ding. Um, Deplatforming, um, like having a speaker invited and then disinviting them because students uh, because like, if it's a student decides to, to change their mind not to invite some uh, someone that's different, but if, if you have a student group and basically like they're overridden by the university to disinvite somebody, um, then that's very bad. However, you get points if you stand up for a speaker's right to speak there, or if you stand up for a student group's rights. Um, so we have the largest database of professor cancellations, by which we mean firings, punishments, student uh, student cancellations. We, we factor in that less because we, we know that we're much more likely to hear about uh, pretty much all of the professors you know, getting fired just for pure opinion um, at at least the top 100 schools in the country because we, we, we follow every single student newspaper in the country, that, that at least that we, that we know of. Um, and, and, and the policies. Um, so, uh, and so combining these factors together, that's how we get the ranking. Now, what are the, some of the common denominators? Um, now, it's interesting who ended up being the, who ended up being the um, worst schools. Harvard, dead last. University of Pennsylvania, second to last. University of South Carolina, thir third from last. And that bucks kind of like people's um, I, perceptions that it would just be uh, like somehow uh, just fit exactly like the way people would assume it would. Um, and then Georgetown, uh, fourth from the bottom. And th the major things that they did is they didn't, they let professors get either punished and or fired. What was a big part of it? I think of the bottom five, there were three schools where 100% of the attempts to get speakers deplatformed were successful. Like, which means that basically the school did not put up a fight at all. They're kind of like, oh, you don't want them to speak here? <laughs> okay. We'll let, we'll, we'll let you decide on that. Um, we definitely found a negative relationship between um, uh, high rates of um, censorship and high rates of anti-Semitism, which was an interesting thing when we correlated those things together. Um, we also found a negative relationship between the number of DEI staff you had and, and the environment for freedom, uh, for freedom of speech as well. There's a lot of interesting side numbers that we, that we, we generated um, uh, out of that. But, uh, and it's funny because like first Harvard thought to f fight their, their rock bottom ranking by claiming the methodology wasn't good. And that gave me the opportunity to go on like Wall Street Journal and like talk to tons of people to explain our methodology, which I'm very proud to defend. And now like Nate Silver uses our, our data because it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's for real Z. I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, lo lots of interesting stuff has come out of the free speech ranking. Hi, so I'm Gabriella, this is Megan. This Hi, is Gabriella, Megan. Hi, this is our attorney, Matthew Hoffman, and we were invited here by Jill Murphy up in the back over there. Um, she invited us here because we're, I don't know if most of you know what's going on, but Megan and I are from SUNY Portland, and so we were invited here to share our perspective on cancel culture as well as is to that's what's happening to us currently. Great. So. Megan and I decided that we wanted to start a Turning Point USA chapter at SUNY Cortland. If you're not familiar with Turning Point USA, it's a 501c3 organization. A group so, we've had to defend all over the country, by the way, um, <laughs> at, at, at yeah. FIRE. Probably the, the most routinely derecognized group. That's actually one of the reasons why yeah. um, Chicago went from number one to 13th is because they wouldn't recognize their Turning Point USA chapter. Yeah, so it supports, you know, um, limited government, free speech, and free markets. And we went through the whole entire process of going to get approved. And so the last part of the process was you have to go up in front of Student Senate. And we went up in front of Student Senate, we presented the club to them. And then a professor had planned an initiated attack on us and two other members who tried starting it with us. He rallied together around 20 other students and four or five other professors. And someone at Student Senate had yielded their time over to the professor. And the professor just immediately started saying, he goes, you know, we're not here to support you. And he spread a whole bunch of misinformation about Turning Point, what was going on, like, like he took he took things out of context, basically, about what speaker said at Turning Point. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all the students in the room had, as if they weren't already attacking us, had started attacking us even more. Mm -hmm. And they ended up denying us, not yeah. because of anything we said, but because of misinformation that they might have been reading. And so right now, we are in a process of a lawsuit with the school. 
and we have received hate from, I'm sure people are familiar with Yik Yak, we have received hate from Yik Yak and saying, you know, these students should be kicked out, they should, you know, be expelled, they're dumb for doing this, and, you know, we're still pushing forward. We actually, part of the lawsuit got approved today, we have now officially become a recognized chapter on Cortland. Okay. So that's good, but a lot of people have reached out to us thanking us for supporting them. Um, but our view on cancel culture, our perspective on it right now is that it happened to us without us even realizing yeah. that it was going to happen to us. We're just your two normal, everyday middle class girls and we were canceled in a second and we're still kind of being canceled by other students. You know, we get looks and when we go out and whatever it is. And so, but that's our perspective. So, you know, even like if you're here and you're too afraid to speak up, we encourage you to speak up because we are now the voice of 50 plus other people on our campus. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say too, I, I knew about your book before I came here, but like hearing you guys speak about it and how we feel about our freedom of speech and being silenced on campus. You've made me want to read the book even more about what you've said so far, so I appreciate it. But um, we just wanted to, we're just trying to make sure that people don't feel silenced, just like you said with colleges silencing students. Even if you have a different view or opinion on something, we want to enhance the idea that we should be speaking about it and not canceling it, like you said. So we appreciate it. We just wanted to thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, sure that's that's that. That. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious if you can comment on FIRE's position or your personal position on grad student unions and how they play into some of the themes in your book. Um, our grad student union here, one of their slogans is work shouldn't hurt. Uh, fine, maybe not, but grad school does hurt. And I'm actually, my biggest concern about our union is the way it reframes independent researchers as proletarian coal miners. It literally, I mean, it's their language, not mine. Um, so I'm curious what that will do. On the other hand, in light of our interim free speech policy and the math department taking down the into five stickers and all the stuff that is going on, the union's actually been sort of uh, a free speech activist. So I have some conflicting feelings about their role. I'm wondering if you if you thought about this. Um, it, it it honestly it depends on what the individual unions do. Um, this one is UE. Yeah, so, and they're ones that I know are organizing a lot of the IV. Uh, the new grad students the last couple of year ones. Yeah. Well, what I mean is it, 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 that our, my opinion on the unions depend on like what the unions actually do. Like I've seen unions take really terrible stances on freedom of speech and academic freedom. And if that's the case, then we oppose them and we explain to universities, particularly public universities, that they have a non-delegable responsibility to protect at, like, at, at SUNY Cortland, for example, the First Amendment rights of, uh, and freedom association rights of their, uh, of their students. Um, so, like I said, we've seen unions that have not been all that harmful to free speech academic freedom. We've seen some that are. And uh, yeah, and, and the intellectuals being the new proletariat is very, very on brand. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for coming all the way to Ithaca. Um, really enjoyed your previous book, Hardly in the American Mind. Uh, I had a little confusion about one of your last statements about um, the anti-Israel protests and the pro-Palestinian protest. Yeah. It seems to me like an organization like FIRE would um, applaud efforts for, for students to go beyond the norm and practice their, their political beliefs in a certain way, as long as they're not canceling other ideas. And on the other hand, you would, your organization would criticize certain, let's say, employers who have um, rescinded the offers of certain law students who have um, expressed pro-Palestinian movements. Shouldn't isn't that the shouldn't that be the goal of your organization? What on earth did I say that was confusing about that? So I thought you had a critical narrative about you said that the pro-Palestinian speeches were a result of this. Um, this restriction on free speech. So I was a little confused because you painted it in a negative light. 
oh, uh, do I disagree with a lot of pro-Palestinian speakers? You bet your ass I do. And particularly ones who don't actually understand um, that from the river to the sea is reasonably interpreted as saying, you want to kill all of my relatives. I'm not Jewish, by the way. Do, I, do we defend their right to say that, though? We absolutely do. And I, I thought I was pretty clear about that. <laughs> How's it going? So Hi. I actually wanted to look at Skokie for a second. Sure. And this idea that I was one of the only law students last year to agree with the Skokie decision to allow the Nazis to march. Uh, at Cornell Law School, I expect the First Amendment to be a little bit more valued. It's not. <laughs> uh, yeah. But with that, this year, in light of October 7th, not a single student in the law school stood up for Skokie. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's because we'll lose our jobs if you say anything against Israel. Uh, maybe if you say pro-Palestinian things, like you'll lose your job in the legal field. However, I just wanted to know your thoughts on Skokie. Uh, I figured it would be rightly decided. Uh, I know some of our professors have advocated for this genocide exception uh, <laughs> and that idea. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I've done so much of this. Uh, the, the, um, we actually did a documentary on, on, on Skokie. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud to be the executive director of three documentaries. One is Can We Take a Joke, which was about the potential threat of a cancel culture to comedy, which was just way too out of its time. It came out in 2015. The next one was Mighty Ira, um, which is about the life and time of Ira Glasser, the former head of the ACLU, who uh, was the executive director right after um, the ACLU was devastated um, uh, by loss of donors and a lot of public hate because they stood up for the Nazis' right to protest at Skokie. Um, and, and Ira is now on our advisory council. Um, Nadine Strawson, uh, who was there for the whole thing, now actually works for FIRE. And, and, and so we believe very strongly it was the right call to stand up for the Nazis' right at Skokie. Now, how is this, how, when, when you uh, have people who are like, oh, but that's, that's protecting hate. I, it bothers me that people think that human beings are so simplistic that letting someone talk and say hateful things will immediately create a ton more Nazis. That is insulting, that is elitist, and it's wrong. And what actually happened when overwhelmingly Jewish lawyers from the ACLU were willing to stand up for the rights of even Nazis, it was seen as an incredibly principled thing by people who cared about it. It was one of the things that I found as inspiring as a first-generation American. I was like, wow, these guys really mean it. It's why I wanted to work at the ACLU back in 1990, uh, 1999, um, because I, I couldn't believe how, how principled they were. But guess what else it did? It let people see how ridiculous and stupid the Illinois Nazis were. They became a national joke, and one of the things that's so great about watching the documentary is when they got to put on their stupid little uniforms and march, and march around, they looked like idiots. And some people, you just have to let them actually show the world. And it, and it absolutely, and what, what would have happened if they had actually had the sexy excuse that essentially, oh, we're so powerful, we're so persuasive that they had to shut us down to keep us from, from recruiting more people, I guarantee you they would have had a longer shelf life. They would have been more successful if people tried to shut them down. It was letting the world see them for who they were that actually destroyed the Illinois Nazi movement um, after, after Skokie. So I'm very, I'm very pro Skokie. I don't think people understand why it was the right call. And R.A. Nyer, um, someone who literally has, you know, uh, his initials from the camp still on his arm was the, was the leader of the ACLU at the time that they defended. He wrote a book called Defending My Enemy to make the point that, listen, as much as I hate these guys, <laughs> um, the bigger fear is the government having power to, to, uh, to pick winners and losers when it comes to freedom of speech. That's what you need to be the most frightened of. And this is the problem with the lack of viewpoint diversity in higher ed is that people in elite institutions, they always now see themselves as being in the position of power. They're kind of like, how can this rule actually be used by you know, philosopher kings like me? And that's why they don't even get Skokie anymore, or at least, and some of them actually do get it, they're just afraid to say it, and that's unfortunately understandable given what I do uh, for a living. Thank you. Thank you, this has been a great conversation. 
I wanted to um, try to add a little bit of dimension to uh, the conversation around DEI. So my initial impression from what you said about DEI is that it's a little bit of a straw man position about what DEI is about. Uh -huh. So I, I work with, um, uh, I do work that's DEI related with my department. And I absolutely recognize that stereotype that you're talking about, about how people think, you know, power is like stratified in very particular ways, easy to identify by group categorization and so on. Absolutely see that. Yep. Um, and that the ways that that motivates the students that I work with to argue for things in particular kinds of ways. But I think people who are doing DEI work on the ground and resolving actual conflicts that you see happening in practice, get their nose pushed into the ways in which those stories just do not at all do justice to what's actually <coughs> happening with marginalization of students. So really simple example, you know, there's a lot of ideas about what's the right language to use and what's the wrong language to use, and certain kinds of language means that you're bigoted and offensive. And the very idea that that is true, that there is one right way to talk about human realities immediately excludes um, foreign students who aren't used to American cultural norms around this. It bites in the butt of working class students who come to the university because it is more related to particular levels of cultural capital to know what the right words and the wrong words are and so on. And you see those conflicts on the ground. So I think there's actually a lot of potential for common ground mm -hmm. between the people who are you know, grossly pro-DEI and anti-DEI. And the number one thing where I see huge overlap is in that concern about bureaucratization. Mm -hmm. So I hear both the anti-DEI people and people who are very highly invested in DEI both saying that the kind of administrative use of it, the turning it into simple check boxes and categories is inherently damaging. And when you talk to people at the university about why that happens, a lot of it seems to be coming down from Title VI and Title IX. Yes which is actually a federal statute, so the landscape is really complex. But what I would like to encourage you, me, everyone to do is to try to find some ways to build that common ground because there are things that people are generally together concerned about. Even Kimberly Crenshaw, when she came, yeah. she talked about freedom of expression in her speak, in the speech and the lack of freedom of expression. There's these opportunities to build that common ground and work together to resolve some of these problems. Yeah. Well, I feel like no sentence begins necessarily all that well with this, but one of my best friends in, at home in D.C. is actually a DEI admin, a, a, a consultant, and she's pretty mad at me when I talk about a lot of DEI stuff. But the most important thing, and one of the reasons why I keep stressing it, is we have had a lot of problems with DEI administrators, and oftentimes empowered by Title VI and Title IX, clamping down on freedom of speech and academic freedom. And, uh, and, I, and since I do think we need um, to decrease the bureaucratization of universities, I do think we need to figure out ways to make the ultimate cost per student lower. And I don't mean like out of pocket, I mean the actual amount of, like because we're, right now, I mean when we're, when we're trying to get a sense of like how much Yale spends per student per year, we're talking about $200,000. And it's like, if you can't educate a single student for a single year for less than $200,000, you have to start somewhere and start first with the ones who pose uh, problems for academic freedom and freedom of speech. Um, and that has unfortunately been in many cases DEI administrators. That's not all they do. I'm not, I'm not, claiming, uh, not claiming they do. I also have seen a lot of evidence that DEI administrators so some of the some of the microaggression policies and California is of course the worst about a lot of this stuff. Um, and how many of the microaggression idea, uh, pop, uh, ideas of what a microaggression actually were, were things that, from a class perspective, are things that working class and immigrant kids would say all the time as being, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I think the most qualified candidate should get, get, should get the job. Like, wait, that's not a okay thing to say? And, some, and sometimes it's done in the name of international students and done in the name of working class students, when it's actually things that are very normal for international and working class students to actually say. So yeah, I, I definitely, I love the idea of reining in t uh, Title IX to make it more free speech protective. That's one of the, one of the big things FIRE has been doing for, for a long time. And, and same thing with, with uh, Title VI. But I, and I'm glad to hear that we agree on we need a much less bureaucratized university uh, going forward. But thank you.
Uh, thanks. I, I've been watching your videos and so forth and following Contributor Fire, so I'm very glad you uh -huh. came all the way to beautiful Ithaca, NY. Um, but my question is about, uh, at the higher level, why are the trustees yeah. and the donors going along with this? So you've talked about what's happening on the ground with the faculty, etc., but the money is coming. Well, first off, the trustees set policy, and yeah. they all... and, and Finally, they actually finally can hire and fire staff formally. Yeah. Uh, and, a professor, uh, and then, why are the donors sticking with this? Uh, with this, and why is there not more uh, over these number of years? And is this a way to? I, I know there's some movement times. So like, what's your feeling about all that? The, the the trustees have been among some of the great disappointments in the reform movement. They don't seem to want to do very much in many cases, but in other cases, when they do try to do something about it, like happened in Dartmouth, the administration finds a way to marginalize them. Um, so, there, you know, for example, there's a board of overseers at Harvard, and every year that you know um, re renegade candidates run, including my mentor Harvey Silverglade, um, they up the ante about like what what will get you through the door. Um, and there are trustees who really want reform. I also feel like a lot of trustees are people who like having the affiliation with the university. They don't want to do a lot for it, um, and they don't really want to rock the boat. Uh, and and that's been that's been profoundly disappointing. I do think a lot of donors are are coming around to there being a problem, and donors can actually have some positive impact on this. But the thing that will probably get me in the most trouble with, with donors, and I, and I think, I'm sure my CEO doesn't want me to say this, I do actually think that they're a little bit of a mixed mind, that as long as they want their grandkids and kids to go to Cornell, they're not gonna rock the boat that much. Um, and I, and I, I've joked, and I'm only half joking, that if we were to end legacy admissions tomorrow, it'd probably be helpful to the larger reform movement because it would break billionaires' um, addiction to elite higher ed in the United States. Um, the, so I, I do think that actually the incentives are all, all, all kind of messed up and that, that donors and, and trustees often don't want to rock the boat even if they see things have gone very wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to get up, but I have one question, which is just the path forward. Like, how do we move from where we are now as a country to a country where uh, expression is, is free and uh, we don't cancel people on either side? I've been yeah. talking too much, Ricky. <laughs> I, I think you should. Um, <laughs> that's an easy one to finish on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, I mean, one of the things that we talked about, and it's kind of going full circle to the first thing I said, is that there was a, a disconnect generationally where people just assumed that, that their kids were going to school and learning the values of free speech or that they, that they actually believed in sticks, or st sticks and stones and that um, you know, the First Amendment principles are actually pervasive in society. And I think that, especially considering how many people are concerned about cancel culture, we know that it's about 80% of people recognize the term and say that it's a bad thing, that they think that political correctness has gone too far. I think, um, Given the fact that you have young people who are motivated to live in a different kind of world, who dislike cancel culture, you have a, a general culture where a lot of people know that they just feel that they're they're on thin ice and walking on eggshells at all points in time. It's a really small fraction of people who are actually in favor of this stuff um, and are, would say that they're actively hostile to free speech. They might not understand it, but I think that you know it's just about starting a conversation and also realizing that this is in many ways a tyranny of the minority. And I learned as soon as I spoke out at NYU that there were people that I never would have imagined who agreed with me. And I think that like as cliche as it sounds, courage is contagious and that there, um, there is a, a widespread enough sense that something's awry in society that if we actually could start to talk about it in a more authentic way, which I think we have been doing in the past couple months, um, just given everything that's been going on in academia, especially that this could be an inflection point to actually having a, a, a nonpartisan re-engagement with free speech principles. Yeah, and and I and I think that there is a, a a cultural moment happening, but it won't make a difference if there's not meaningful structural reform. Like if there aren't cheaper, uh, more rigorous ways that people can, you know. Uh, signal and credential um, in the same way that they do with elite higher education uh, about how smart and hardworking they are. You know, like I, I think none of this is going to change. I think if we we have to figure out ways to get more people from different regions and different economic classes and backgrounds actually meeting each other in unintermediated space, 
and I don't know exactly how to do that. Um, I mean, one of the, the uh, but I but I do think that we need to really think about the incentives we've created, what we massively fund, and think hard on how, you know what kind of country we want to live in. Because I, I think the uh, I, I think that if we let this moment pass without really thinking pretty hard about a way we can have. Americans not at each other's throats quite as much just by virtue of the fact that they have a friend in Arizona or they or they have a friend in Queens. Um, you know, uh, we're it's only our problems only going to get deeper and worse. So I have to end it now because there's an exam in here in uh -huh. at, at seven thirty. So I want everybody, please, um, after we say thank you, to get out quickly. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank you for coming because it takes a certain amount of courage to come to this kind of event so i i appreciate it and i thank you and i really want to thank ricky and greg for coming and just <laughs>